I'm Mark Golub, and I'm coming to you now from the Polish consulate in New York City, where we're about to experience an extraordinary event. This person here is Jan Karski. Jan Karski, who was born in Poland, ultimately grew up during the days of Nazi Germany. He fought the Nazis. He was captured by the Nazis. He was tortured by the Nazis. He escaped time and time again and became part of the Polish underground. And he witnessed the way in which the Nazis were exterminating the Jews of Poland. And he made it a mission of his life to let the world know of the Nazi brutality, the Nazi atrocity, the Nazi, the Nazi attempt to destroy every Jewish child, woman, and man on the face of the earth. And Jan Karski made his way to Washington, D.C. and made his way into the Oval Office, the White House, to sit with then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to tell Roosevelt in detail the atrocities being perpetrated against the Jewish people. It seems that Franklin Roosevelt didn't want to hear about it, didn't want to hear it. There's this maybe a legend, maybe it's true, that when Jan Karski began speaking of the victimization of the Jews, all Roosevelt wanted to talk about was how are they treating the horses? It is so hard to believe that part of the story. And I've met with people here today who say it didn't happen, and I've met with people who say it did. But I don't know one thing factually. Jan Karski, this extraordinary Polish Catholic man, dedicated his life to letting the world know of the Nazi annihilation, the Nazi Holocaust. It's our hope on Shalom TV that through this program, if you didn't know him before, you will get to know an extraordinary human being who has been honored by Yad Vashem, Jan Karski. Good evening. Uh, I welcome all of you at the Consulate General of the Republic of Poland in New York to celebrate the legacy of the late Jan Karski, 23 days before his 100th birthday. For first timers, I wish a wonderful evening and invite you to return often to this place in Manhattan then it's very easy to recognize from our patron who is positioned permanently outside the entrance of the consulate, none other than Jan Karski. Those who are looking for the Morgan Library, I must confess, are told that isn't on the other side of the street at the Jan Karski corner. <laughs> Uh, we can count on Karski to do one thing for us. He always unites people of different faiths, of different nationalities, of differing politics. Each time we met in his name, people have the uncanny feeling of dropping our differences and drawing closer to each other. Tonight, we expect all of you to experience what our dear friend Bob Billingsley described as Karski Karma for yourself. I'm so happy to be back here at the Polish Consulate in New York, where three years ago, under the gracious leadership of Consul General Ewa Junczyk Szymetska, we launched the Karski Initiative with three main constituencies. Georgetown University alums, Jewish American representatives, and Polish American community. Haven't we come a long way, baby? Yes. <laughs> Our first goal, that Karski would receive the highest civilian recognition in America, was granted in 2012 when President Obama presented a posthumous Presidential Medal of Freedom to Jan Karski. The second great achievement was working with Georgetown University Press to bring back into print 
Sikorsky's 1944 classic Story of a Secret State, and that happened last year. Last year also, the Jan Karski Educational Foundation, together with its Polish sister, were created. And very soon, very soon, we will have another exciting announcement. But today, the big news is that 100 years ago this month, 100 years ago this month, a baby boy, a Roman Catholic named Jan Kozielewski, the youngest of eight children, was born in Łódź. This boy was destined to become the ma man who made a mark on history as Jan Karski. Why is Karski so important 100 years after his birth, 75 years after the outbreak of World War II? As an actor in history, the man who warned Allied leaders about the ongoing German Nazi genocide in occupied Poland and the bloodbath on the ground when precious lives could have been saved. His life was heroic, historical, the stuff of a Hollywood movie that is destined to be made. But why is Karski relevant today? And how does he speak to young people? I would suggest to you that Jan Karski is a role model for us all because, like Abraham Foxman, he is an advocate for the other. In Karski's case, as a Polish Roman Catholic, he put his life on the line for his fellow countrymen, Poles of Jewish origin. Like Karski's countryman, Raphael Lemkin, who coined the term genocide and was the catalyst for the 1948 United Nations resolution against genocide, Lemkin was a Polish Jew whose first interest in the subject came from reading Quo Vadis, Henryk Sienkiewicz, uh, the Nobel Prize winner's famous book. Lemkin's young heart went out to the persecuted Christians in the Roman Empire under the Emperor Nero. Lemkin, like Karski, embraced the suffering of the other as his own. Karski's story resonates with young people today because he was young. He was age 25 in 1939 when he was called to bravery to join the Polish underground resistance movement to fight German Nazi rule in occupied Poland. Karski had two transformative lives. First, during this reign of terror and the Holocaust in occupied Poland, during this time, this ambitious man was forced to face his mortality and his heart grew three sizes in the process. The second transformative period for Karski was after the war, when he could not return to his beloved Poland, then communist. The communists were busy killing off those brave members of the Polish underground resistance for fear that they would resist them. So Karski transformed the horrors that he had experienced, the permanent memories that he saw in the Warsaw Ghetto, is Izbica Lubelska and elsewhere, and created a new role for himself as a professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, as a model to influence the lives of thousands, some of whom are in this room tonight. Karski has left a wonderful document of this most dramatic and memorable period of his life, working on behalf of the Polish underground. It is story of a secret state, and it is the goal of our foundation that every student in America read this book. And students can be lifelong learners, so any age is a good time to read it. The book has the power to change lives. Now, I would like to call on a very special and important person to the Karski campaign, the Polish consulate, um, ADL, I know, um, all of us at the Jan Karski Educational Foundation. Leo O'Donovan. It was the eyes you remembered. The searching, pale, blue, Polish eyes that always saw beyond and understood and remembered. The man came from another place and time, one felt, a place of dignity and integrity, 
a time of courage and commitment, a community of just men and women who cared for each other deeply and equally. But he seemed to come from a place of peace only because first and profoundly he had passed through such suffering. I saw terrible things, he would simply searingly say. The handsome, commanding face of the aristocratic young diplomat aged. Savage Nazi torture more than hastened the process. The tall, lean frame grew bent and fragile, but the piercing eyes became somehow even more resolute, unforgettable, windows to the witness of a century's gaping horror and faint hope, its deepest abysses and its glimmer of possible salvation. Born, as Wanda said, on the 24th of April in 1914, I followed him 20 years later, exactly to the day, <laughs> as the youngest of eight children uh, in the city of Lutz, he later became Karski, his name as a secret agent. Jan showed great talent at the Jesuit school he attended, became a young man of ardent faith, and appeared to have a distinguished career before him when, on completing two master's degrees at the Jan Kazimierz University in Lwów, he entered the Pol Polish diplomatic service. But then the great crevice of the 20th century engulfed him, as we know now, though for decades he sought through silence to escape the scenes of suffering he had seen. After enlisting in the army in 1931, he was captured by Soviet troops, but then escaped from their detention camp. He joined the Polish underground and became one of its finest couriers, but was captured again in 1940, this time by the Gestapo, and even tried to kill himself by slashing his wrists so as to avoid divulging secret information. Amazingly, he was rescued from the hospital and returned to his underground work. This led to his mission in 1942 to bring news of the Polish situation to the West. Preparing for that, Jan managed to visit the ghetto of Warsaw and the Belzec death camp so that he could assure London and Washington that Hitler's threatened extermination of the Jews was the hideous truth. But neither Anthony Eden nor Franklin Roosevelt nor Felix Frankfurter in 1943 could really believe the young witness to unspeakable horror. And it was only on the publication of his partly autobiographical story of a secret state in 1944 that Karski's heroism in revealing the Holocaust began to be recognized. Years later, Jan would say of this time, the Lord assigned me a role to speak and write during the war when, as it seemed to me, it might help. It did not. Then I became a Jew. Like the family of my wife, in 1965, he married the dancer and choreographer Pola Nirenska, who was such a dream to listen to. I seldom understood a word, but it was like listening to music. She had a very thick accent, and so she lowered her voice, and you leaned closer and closer, and then she lowered it more, and you leaned closer, <laughs> and still understood very little. Like the family of my wife, all of them perished in the ghettos and the concentration camps and the gas chambers. So all murdered Jews became my family. But I am a Christian Jew. I am a practicing Catholic. My faith tells me that the second original sin has been committed by humanity through commission or omission or self-imposed ignorance or insensitivity or self-interest or hypocrisy or heartless rationalization. This sin will haunt humanity to the end of time. It does haunt me, he said, and I want it to be so. This is where, for the most part, the popular account of Jan Karski's life generally ends. A man who had seen unspeakable suffering and announced it to the world 
in 1981 expressed his profound resignation. One year later, nevertheless, he was recognized by the Israeli government as one of the righteous among nations. There were, however, other things that Jan Karski saw. And if, in this month especially, we are adequately to remember this just man in whose heart the Spirit of God dwelt, they should be mentioned. And they were these. First, his country, and second, his university, and third, the judgment to come. This blessed land he often called America, and in my hearing at no time more eloquently than in May of 1923, the year he died, when he returned from Poland at four o'clock in the morning so as to attend a dinner given by the Anti-Defamation League and honoring Cardinal Hickey, who was to be presented the Jan Karski Award. Jan spoke first and memorably, invoking for a mesmerized audience what a blessed land this was. He was puzzled by the United States, however. He always remained very European in dress and manner, but he had a clear passion for American democracy, for American opportunity, for American equality. After the war, he had not been able to allow himself to return to a communist Poland, and in 1954 became a naturalized American citizen. He loved his native land, of course, and remained always a Polish hero. But he spoke so eloquently, urging his hearers always not to forget, dear friends, this blessed land. He also came to see every part of his university. In 1943, during his first visit to inform the American government of the Holocaust, he had met Father Edmund Walsh, the founder and then regent of the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. In 1949, he returned to visit Father Walsh and asked for his advice. Father Walsh, whom Jan admired as a Renaissance prince capable of being quite imperious, my fellow Jesuit, told Jan that even though he was 35 and had two advanced degrees, he must go back to school and begin a full doctoral program. Then on the very evening that he received his PhD, there was a telegram waiting from Father Walsh to invite him to become a member of the Georgetown faculty. His classes were enormously popular and enormously effective. He specialized in the theory of communism and comparative politics, and in 1985 published his major work, The Great Powers and Poland, 1919 to 1945, from Versailles to Yalta. But it was the students and his colleagues of whom he was proudest. He supported the new young dean, Peter Crow, steadily and readily through all of Peter's remarkable leadership. He was proud when so distinguished a faculty member as Madeleine Corbell Albright was chosen to fill his position when he retired. And there are other things as well from his tenure at Georgetown that we should remember. Certainly, especially relevant today, his deep commitment to alleviating poverty and his wonderful wry sense of humor. And the cigarette that balanced at the end of his long slender fingers and seemed never to go out, nor five o'clock when he would regularly announce, gentlemen, it's time for a martini. <laughs> Jan Karski died at Georgetown Uni University Hospital on the 13th of July in the year 2000, on the hilltop which had been his academic home for over half a century. There he kept silence about what he had seen then spoke of it for humanity's sake. At war's end, he said, I hated humanity. But gradually, for humanity's sake, he spoke. National audiences, but students especially, listened. At Georgetown, he saw generations of students pass through his classes and knew in his keen, modest way how they marveled at his teaching, his political passion, his mysterious person. But John Karski saw more. He had seen the cross of Christ at the gulf of the century. 
he had heard the cry of abandonment from millions of brothers and sisters of Jesus of Nazareth. He was, knew he was preparing to see, to see still more his God, and he said some years before he died, I don't show it, but I am a religious man. I know God gives us not collective but individual conscience. It is this beautiful part of man. He has a choice. He is free to follow evil. He is free to choose right. Everyone is responsible to his creator individually. There will come a moment when I will be called. This will be the last judgment. God will say to me, Karski, I gave you your soul. Your body died. Your soul is mine. I gave it to you. What did you do with your soul? And I will have to answer. I want to make heaven. I want to make salvation. I am old and no longer strong. I don't need courage anymore, so I teach compassion. And so in the final years of his retirement, he did continue to teach compassion. And every Sunday, despite the terrible affliction of his wife's death in 1992, went to communion at St. Anne's Church. And now he has died and left us as far as sight goes. Some months before his death though, he wrote and sent me a very generous gift, asking that I do with it whatever I would choose. We now have a scholarship in George, at Georgetown in honor of Pola, his wife, and the Stations of the Cross in Dahlgren Chapel are now illuminated through Jan's gift. I think of him whenever I'm there, and I think of Mark's Gospel, which ends with the burial of Jesus in the tomb. Open for hope in the resurrection, open for anyone puzzled about this life of a Jew in a small corner of the world. And I think, if I should make salvation, Jan Karski will explain all of this to me. Thank you. It is a great privilege and honor to participate in this program honoring Jan Karski. Jan Karski's life has deep meaning for me on a personal level, on a philosophical level, and on an institutional level. On a personal level, I cannot help but associate the courageous and historic actions that he undertook with those of a much simpler person, my Polish Catholic nanny who never heard of Jan Karski, who saved my life during the Holocaust. Heroism, heroism comes in many forms, the far far too infrequently. Two real heroes to me were Jan Karski and my nanny Bronislava Kurpi, both Poles who had real impact on real people. On a philosophical level, Jan Karski's life confirms the most profound level that each and every person can make a difference. Jan Karski's wondered about what he accomplished since the West did not respond to his message. His frustration is understandable, but his witness becomes even more important as time goes on. There is no better teaching tool for young people than to examine the life of Jan Karski, the moral imperative to stand up in the face of evil, no matter the personal risk, the persistence in the face of the obstacles and prejudice, and the clarity, the clarity he provided 
when later it was said, had we only known. Institutionally, institutionally Jankarski's life had a significant impact on the work of the organization I've been privileged to lead for many years. The concept of focusing not only on the horrors of the Holocaust, its perpetrators, its collaborators, its bystanders, but also on those who stood up. A hallmark of ADL's work is embodied in our Courage to Care Award. As you've heard, I've been privileged recently to rename it in honor of Jan Karski. Karski's example, of course, resonates for us beyond the Holocaust. As the threat and the actuality of genocide appear and reappear time and again in our beleaguered world, the need, the quest for Jan Karski's to arise in every generation is unfortunately as important as ever. Bearing witness is what it's all about. And not coincidentally, our highly successful program to educate Catholic school teachers around us about the Holocaust, anti-Semitism bigotry is called bearing witness. Jan Karski was the ultimate witness, and for that, for that we are eternally grateful. I am one of, I hope, not too few in this room who had the schus, who had the privilege to be touched by Jan Karski, to listen to him, to engage him, to learn from him, to be inspired by him. Tehei nishmata tzrura b'tzrura chayim. May his soul, his memory, be bound up in eternal life, in life with us forever. Thank you. What a pleasure I have. I'm standing now with Wanda Urbanska, who is the president of the Jan Karski Educational Foundation, who spoke at this event and was just marvelous. And Wanda, you know, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you for coming. We're just thrilled that you're going to give this coverage. Absolutely. I know there are many people watching, and we have Jews and non-Jews watching on Shalom TV. Many people know about Jan Karski, and Wanda, many do not. Yes, that's the sad reality, is, is isn't it? it? Okay. Yes. May I ask, how did you come to know so much about Jan and become involved in the Educational Foundation? Well, I have, my own father was a Polish Catholic of the era of Jan Karski, so I was privileged to read his book, Story of a Secret State, many years ago. And at the time, I was stunned to learn about the secret state and all that he had done on behalf of Polish Jewish and Polish Catholic citizens. Three years ago, I was tapped to head the Jan Karski U.S. Centennial Campaign, and our first goal was to place Karski's name and nomination for a Presidential Medal of Freedom. Which he did win. Which amazingly, we were so thrilled less than one year after the inaugural dinner here at the Polish Consulate in New York, hosted by Ewa Junczyk Jamecka, uh, we were in the White House receiving the medal from President Obama. Amazing, amazing. Uh, amazing. And then, then the next thing that happened was Karski's book. There's this thing called Karski Karma. It <laughs> seems to operate bringing Karski back to the fore. Okay. Now the name of his book is? Story of a Secret State. Okay. And the essence of the book is what? The story of a secret state is about the Polish resistance to Nazi terror in occupied Poland. Many people don't know. Exactly. Many people don't know that, for instance, the Polish underground was the first organized group that had a group called Zygota, a formal group designated to saving Jews in occupied Poland. And the, most, the greatest number of those recognized by Yad Vashem are Poles for saving their fellow Polish citizens, Jews. And so Karski is about building bridges. He himself was a Polish Catholic, his wife was a Polish Jew, and he was a citizen of three nations. He was born a, a Pole, 
He became a naturalized American and an honorary citizen of Israel. That's wonderful. Wanda, you said something very important. I want you to follow up on it. There is so much misinformation around the Holocaust and the Jewish experience in World War II yes. that from the Jewish perspective devastated a third of our people, six million Jews. And as a result, the history of the Holocaust is very sacred yes. to the Jewish people. Yes. But one of the sad things is that for many, many generations now, since the Holocaust, there have been many Jews who have not understood the extent to which, A, it's not simply the righteous Gentile. There were hundreds and hundreds of people, and Jan Karski symbolizes yes. the resistance to Nazi Germany, having nothing to do with Jews, and also trying to save Jews. Yes. And Jan Karski was also, what, one of the things he reported on, if I'm not mistaken, was the horrors in the Warsaw Ghetto, correct? Yes, absolutely. Karski very famously went into the Warsaw Ghetto in 1942 twice, putting his life at peril, and he was shocked. These are memories from the two visits that haunted him the rest of his life. He witnessed a Jew hunt in which the young Nazi officers were shooting Jews for sport. And then later, he went in disguise to a Nazi transit camp, Izbica Lubelska, so that he could actually be witness and go out to the West and report on what he'd seen. Oh, yeah. And my point, and you've, you've helped make it, is that in some way the Jewish community never had the chance to understand that side of the Polish story. Yes, there were exactly. horrors perpetrated against Jews sure. and there was a history of anti-Semitism in Poland. Exactly. That's part of the story. But this is a very important part. Yes. And Wanda, I don't feel it's being taught enough, understood enough, and that's why I'm so pleased you have a chance to talk and that you gave us a chance to be here at this extraordinary event. Well, thank you so much. And Karski is celebrated by the Jewish community. Yes the Polish Catholic community, citizens of the world, and his is a legacy. His is a book that should be read and known by everyone. So I just invite everyone to read Story of a Secret State, and one of the goals of our foundation is to have every student in America be aware of Karski and his heroism. Well, I'm thrilled by the way you're hearing about this book <laughs> through Shalom TV and through this event. I have one last question to ask you. Yes. You know, Many of us understand Jan Karski as having not only the courage, he's, he was captured by the Nazis, he survived, he joins the Polish underground. He is fighting for the, you know, for humanity yes. on such an enormous scale. And then he has really, in, in, in Yiddish by the way, the word is chutzpah, the yes. nerve to come to the White House and to speak to the President of the United States and to other members of the cabinet yes. and American officials of the time, doing his best to spread a message. Right. The, mes the truth about the horror of the Holocaust. I want you to speak for one moment to the extent to which you know. What do you understand happened in his meeting with Franklin Delano Roosevelt? And how do you personally kind yes. of view the heroism in the broadest sense of Jan Karski? Oh, what an amazing question. Um, first of all, www.jankarski.net is our website and we have transcripts and links to the actual transcript of the conversation with President Roosevelt. So you can read for yourself what was very interesting is how, first of all, how knowledgeable Roosevelt really was about the situation on the ground in occupied Poland. Secondly, he didn't want to hear about the Jewish situation. So when Karski brought it up, he moved to another subject. Roosevelt moved to another subject. He moved to another subject. He, he quickly asked Karski about the condition of the horses in Poland. Is that a true story? Yes, that's a true story. And now, I can say that also Felix Frankfurter, himself a Jew, is very famous for saying, I can't believe you. And, and actually, Karski met with him with the Polish ambassador, Jan Cichanowski, and he said, what do you mean, Mr. Frankfurter? Are you calling him a liar? He's saying, no, I'm telling you, I'm unable to believe him. There's a difference. The story was so fantastic, it was hard to believe. It's, it's hard to believe. His even story. now, even now. Even today, yes. it's hard to believe his story. And Karski, when he first left the White House, he thought, something's gonna happen. I've spoken to the most powerful man in the world, 
that's going to stop. And it didn't. And it, didn't. and it haunted him his whole life. A fabulous story. By the way, here you are, a nice Catholic girl. You're, <laughs> you're involved with Karski, with Jews. Where are you from? I was born in South Bend, Indiana. Yes. And I'm half Polish on my father's side, and I'm a mixture on my mother's side. So. Well, well, you're fabulous. Well, thank By the way, you. This oh, is Wanda you. Urbanska, who is the president of the Jan Karski Educational Foundation. She spoke brilliantly, and it's so kind of you to give us a moment. Oh, In Hebrew, we say, Kol Tuva Hatzlacha, which means all good success in all of your endeavors. Thank you, thank so, you so much. much. Mwah. Mwah. An thank extraordinary you. honor to be standing with Father Leo O'Donovan, who is the past president of Georgetown University. When did you become president? I was elected, Mark, in 1989, which was great fun because I had gone to Georgetown, and 1989 was the end of our 200th year anniversary. So I spent my first year as president wandering around the country asking people if they would come with me into our third century. And did they say yes? They all came. That's wonderful. <laughs> By the way, you know you were president, and I know you still have an association. You're with one of the great institutions on the American scene, and so it's just an honor to, you know, just Thank to you. talk to you in that Thank regard. You. I have the same bias. <laughs> you came here today to talk about, I guess, a friend. It sounded to me like Jan Karski was not only a hero, but a friend of yours. Do I have it right? I'd like to say that, but I would, I never had him as a teacher because I was in the college and he taught in the School of Foreign Service. And I, furthermore, was a pre-med student for a long time. So uh, I, know, I knew him as to his classes from students. And then when I was, as Wanda said, his boss, <laughs> I never felt like that. He was of such modest manner. And, excuse me, that's what I wanted you to tell me about. If I were in his home, if I had the, you know, the great opportunity, the pleasure of knowing him, what was his tone? What was, what was he like? He would want to talk serious politics, world affairs, serious, but he would like to have a good martini, and he was very, very witty. Was he? And he, so he had a sense of humor? A great sense of humor, dry. He, um, he was famed for forming friendships, keeping in touch with people, and getting together with people who could inform each other. He, in that respect, he remained a diplomatic courier all his life. Father O'Donovan. He was also, I should say, Mark, preposterously, embarrassingly dedicated to the Jesuits. Was he? Well, he that must have thrilled you. Uh, it embarrassed me. It was, he, I, we were not worthy of it. <laughs> but he had gone to a Jesuit school, and he had been embraced by Father Walsh to teach at Georgetown which was his home for all those years. Uh, he lived in Washington, and uh, it became his life. Okay. And that's why I, I wanted to emphasize today that there was a second transformative moment when he was a patriot in another way, which I think is a tribute to his witness to the Holocaust, because he, he went on living, and the way he lived, writing, uh, fascinating students, brought new life into the world when he might have despaired. Because as I mentioned, in 1981, he was very resigned. And at the end of the war, as I, as I said, he said, I hated humanity. Yeah. Very powerful Chilling. statement. Chilling. Chilling. Well, so when he, be, when he turns to teaching resolutely and wittily, and passionately, you say, the good is winning. You continue to anticipate questions of mine. I'm very impressed. <laughs> you know, in this the is not the first time I've been interviewed. <laughs> in the Jewish community, he would be called a survivor. He survived the Holocaust. Yes. Sometimes a survivor is scarred for life in a way that leaves a bitterness in him. Yes. Was Jan in any way bitter, as you could tell? I don't think so. And, um, and I frankly think that uh, the word survivor is necessary and so to speak canonical mm -hmm. 
to uh, embody all that has been suffered. But I think it's inadequate to the lives of the survivors. They are survivors with gifts to give and with blessings yet to be received and uh, witness to give in a way that is reconciling. That doesn't <clears throat> automatically appear in the term survivor. It's like speaking of a cancer survivor. It's a somewhat negative concept. You didn't lose. You got through it. But the people I know who, whom I admire, especially as survivors, are people who got through it and then came to new life. You're very wonderful. When did you become a priest? I can't remember. <laughs> 1966. You've been a priest a long time. I have, I have. You love it? I do. I you do. love the church? I love being a priest every year more. I loved the church before Pope Francis. <laughs> and now i got to go to a date. Uh, but it's been an honor meeting you. Thank I you. wish you all the best. Kol tu we say in, in Hebrew. All goodness and success to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Father pleasure. was out of him. And so now what a pleasure standing with a dear friend, Abe Foxman, the national director of ADL, and one of the honored guests here at the Jan Karski Memorial today. And again, this is the Jan Karski, uh, the Jan Karski Courageous Mission Humanities Hero. And in essence, everybody here was here to remember and pay honor. And the way in which this man here, Abe Foxman, both was part of the ceremony and the words he expressed, by the way, you touched me deeply. So my question for you is simple. You were from Poland yourself. Mm -hmm. You're a survivor. And you talked very movingly, and we've talked about this before, how your Polish nanny saved your life. So I want to know in here, when you come and you hear, and once again are reminded, you know this story, but you're reminded again of Jan Karski. And Abe, you and I know there are many Jews who do not know the name Jan Karski. So I'm asking for you to help me. Number one, place him for the Jews who are watching right now who don't know why this is such an unusual man. And then, what does it mean to Abe Foxman, given the arc of your own life, to be here for this kind of moment? Well, it's, it's more for my children and grandchildren. That's lovely. It's, I know, I was saved by someone who had the courage, maybe not, <laughs> not the savvy, but just the human courage. Jan Karski is important, I would say, to my grandchildren because he's a symbol of an individual who, in the midst of hell, had the courage to stand up and say, look what people are doing to other people. He was a Catholic. He could have looked away. He could have run away. He risked his life. And the tragedy of his life was that for many, many years, the Polish people didn't recognize him as a hero. So, to me now, it's more important to do this in the Polish consulate. I think to the Jewish community, he was a hero, and those who know the history know. What's important is he's being recognized here by the Polish government, by Polish citizens. He's being celebrated in Poland. And for the President of the United States to give a Presidential Medal of Honor posthumously to a Pole who did what? who wanted to tell the world, give out, they're killing Jews. So it's, it's very symbolic. Yeah, we do it. We call our courage to care war, Jankowski. I think Jewish children should know that there was a courageous Pole who stood up, who wanted to know, who, who, who wanted to help. But I think it's more important here. It's important that the Polish people realize what kind of a hero he was for Polish history. Right. So it did mean something to you, by the way. We have two Catholic people. A woman and a priest, Father O'Donovan and, and Wanda, who heads the educational... Oh, Georgetown. He taught at George, Georgetown, yes. which is a Catholic university. So, so in essence, it is a statement of where the Polish community now is recognizing, is yes. yes? Yes. Yeah. And, and look, if he becomes a hero for the Catholic world, that's also important. That's an important message. Okay. But also for my grandchildren. Okay. <laughs> Abe, one of the things that he's known for is his famous meeting with President Roosevelt. 
And in the Jewish world, there is sort of a revisionist history about whether Roosevelt was a hero to the Jews, whether he did enough. Did he do enough when the St. Louis tried to duck? Did he do enough when he was warned, when, he was, when people said to him, bomb the tracks? And then there's this story that Jan Karski comes to FDR, and FDR didn't, you know, Wanda says FDR didn't even want to hear it. In your position as National Director of ADL, I want you to speak for a moment. How do you envision, how do you envision all this? What's it mean to you? And what would you suggest the America Jewish community? How do we look Roosevelt, at it? America under Roosevelt went to war to save Europe for democracy. But it went to, uh, to war too late to save the Jews of Europe. You don't blame FDR. <laughs> he, he never understood if America had gone to war earlier, they could have saved the Jews, but they didn't. And by the time this comes around, there's really very little he could do, you're saying. Well, are I you angry? I, are, you, listen, are you angry he didn't bomb the tracks? Listen, the more we know, and every day, more and more of our history, the more we know what America knew, what the Allies knew, they knew early on how many Jews were being killed in 41 in Bialystok and in Minsk, and they knew, and they did nothing. So am I angry? Of course I'm angry. Knowing and not doing anything, and this is what Karski is so important, he put a lie, he put a lie to this, they didn't know, if only we knew. Well, he went and he said, here. So they knew and they didn't do. That makes it even worse. As always, it is wonderful to hear you. It's wonderful to talk to you. It's wonderful that you were part of this. You meant so much to the people in this room, and you mean so much to me. Kol tu Thank you. Abe, Abe, Abe Foxman of ADL. I'm Simchas. A tribute to an extraordinary human being, Jan Karski, whom I hope you now have a better sense of. It's been a real honor to bring this program to you from the Polish consulate in New York on Shalom TV. I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.